Emily, what's on your radar? So yesterday, Elon Musk said he wants four times as many people to use Twitter. Now, don't get me wrong. I think Musk is a net benefit for the company, which, whether we like it or not, is very powerful. Twitter with freer speech is better than Twitter without it. But Twitter doesn't work. It's hurting us, and its problems are foundational. We should want it to wither away. Of all the major social media platforms, Twitter is the most niche. Only a small percentage of the population is among its daily users. I once actually calculated the number to be about 8.2%, and that's already way too much. As of 2018, about a quarter of American adults said they used Twitter, and less than half of that quarter said they used it every day. Now, Musk isn't your average social media baron. He comes to this project with less naivete about tech. Whether you agree with Musk or not, he's not stumbling into space like Mark Zuckerberg stumbled into Facebook. On a Thursday call with Twitter employees, Musk framed his mission in a pretty broad context. Quote, I want Twitter to contribute to a better, long-lasting civilization where we better understand the nature of reality, he said, adding that he wanted Twitter to help people, quote, better understand the nature of the universe as much as it is possible to understand. That mission is complete. As much as it is possible, Twitter is one big case study in human nature, and we failed that test. <laughs> Without forces that compel us to be good in the physical public square, like face-to-face -face interaction and local stakes, we turned the dumb bird site into a hellscape. And of course we did. We're humans. We need social guardrails that platforms like Twitter just fundamentally can't provide because they wouldn't be engaging for us. I love the site as a news aggregator. It's made it easier for me to connect with other journalists, with academics, with activists, and with readers and viewers. I have one of those jobs where you almost can't do it without Twitter, unfortunately. But in the aggregate, the ease of access is just not worth the cost. For every feel-good story on Twitter, there are 20 examples of breathless pylons. Studies have found that Twitter amplifies moral outrage. But more importantly than that, it's designed to be addictive. Judson Brewer is an addiction psychiatrist and neuroscientist who teaches at Brown. He explains Twitter's design well. Quote, from a psychological standpoint, he wrote in 2019, Twitter taps into our natural reward-based learning processes. Trigger, behavior, reward. We have an idea or think of something funny. Trigger, tweet it out, behavior, and re receive likes and retweets reward. This learning process causes a dopamine rush in reward centers of the brain, the nucleus accumbens. I probably said that incorrectly. The more we do this, the more this behavior gets reinforced, added Brewer, based on the evolutionary adaptive survival process that helps us remember where food is. Our brains are now learning a new habit loop of survival. We can even track our own relevance by the number of impressions, tweets, and followers we have. Twitter does not work without likes and retweets. There are certainly creative or algorithmic tweaks Musk can make to mitigate the site's addictiveness. He's probably thinking uh, in, ter in bigger terms when it comes to solutions than I am. Maybe he thinks a less addictive Twitter would attract a bigger user base. Less addictive is better, but it's still not good. In a conversation on Joe Rogan's show, Musk revealed a really helpful, I think, cornerstone of the way he sees the world. Quote, even in a benign scenario, we are being left behind, he said. So how do you go along for the ride if you can't beat them, join them? That was about AI. He then added, we are already a cyborg to some degree. You've got your phone, you got your laptop. If you're missing your phone, it feels like missing limb syndrome. He is right, of course. You might call him a realist. I think that perspective actually is, is both realist and kind of defeatist. What does any of this have to do with our immediate well-being, though? Why does it matter to the majority of people who aren't on Twitter? There are two major reasons. First, one of the most powerful people in the world sees you as a potential customer of, a, of an addictive and unhealthy product. And it's a product that we've transferred a huge chunk of our politics and culture onto because the people in urban bubbles who run our politics and culture use it to steer discourse and policy. Cancel culture as we know it would absolutely not have existed without Twitter, which blew up the complaints of local, uh, of vocal minorities into news stories because journalists and publicists would see negative tweets and turn them into headlines, which then set norms. Second, there are well-funded efforts to either create parallel institutions or, like Musk's bid here, revamp the broken ones. I remember asking the CEO of Parler this a year or two ago. Speech standards aside, what are you doing to be better than Twitter. 
Building back speech neutral institutions would be an improvement, sure, but accepting that our politics and culture is going to be litigated on addictive digital platforms that warp the discourse is not a satisfactory answer. Why did Twitter employees freak out in some deeply hyperbolic and weird ways after the call yesterday. Partially because addictive social media platforms are making us sick. They're fueling the destructive culture of narcissism that Christopher Lash wrote about all the way back in 1979. Quote, personal relations founded on reflected glory, on the need to admire and be admired, prove fleeting and insubstantial, he observed all that, all that time ago. I wanna read one more just great, delicious quote from Culture of Narcissism. Lash wrote, the mass media with their cult of celebrity and their attempt to surround it with glamor and excitement have made Americans a nation of fans, moviegoers. The media give substance to and thus intensify narcissistic dreams of fame and glory, encourage the common man to identify himself with the stars and to hate the herd and make it more and more difficult for him to accept the banality of everyday existence. Now, I sincerely hope Elon Musk can make Twitter better, but there's no version of Twitter that will ever make us better. Ryan, this entire conversation about Twitter seems so myopic to me because when it comes to Elon Musk, all we're talking about is his plans for free speech on the platform. This is a guy who's like in charge of SpaceX and Neuralink. He's doing huge things. He's not nearly as myopic as the media, I think, conversation that covers him is. Isn't this a bigger, a much bigger question than the one of speech? And it, aren't all of our conversations about these platforms, do you feel like the conversation about free speech has, has dominated in a way that's almost distracting to some of the deeper problems at play? Well, yes, while also missing the actual conversation about free speech and censorship, <laughs> the, the biggest threat to censorship obviously is the Chinese government, like in, in the world. Rel Absolutely. Rel like just proportionally, rel like that is, that is quite obvious. They tried to get, uh, Twitter to shut down a bunch of accounts in Hong Kong when they were when they were cracking down on dissent there, and Twitter said no, we're not we're not doing that. Elon Musk gets sources and a ton of his material, uh, the financing, etc. Like the links between him and 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 China and the Chinese political economy are intense. Mm -hmm. So how, what's he going to do about that when China comes knocking again and says, oh, we want this dissident in this country's account shut down, or we would like. We'd like to know, actually, know, what's their address? Can you tell us where they are? Because they have been known to rendition people. They, they learn it from the best. Mm -hmm. So we're having this giant free speech conversation, which I think is distracting from the broader conversation, but it doesn't even encompass the entire free speech conversation as it, as it ought to. No, Unless you right. think well, free speech is fine, but it, uh, it, it's OK that uh, you know, we can have somebody who's leveraged by China. Running the, running the platform, like, have, have you thought this through? Seriously like, leveraged by China. I mean, he yeah. just had like a red carpet opening in Xinjiang, of all places. Yeah. Um, no. And, this, and like, like, nothing against his business practices, etc. I mean, plenty against his business practices, but that's a separate question. <laughs> it, it's okay if you want to be a, a global multi, multi-billionaire and, and be involved with China, that, like, that's how it works. But then to also say that you're going to be this independent, free speech-minded uh, patron of this of this site just doesn't comport with the reality of how that's going to work. But your your other point is is an interesting one too. But what do we do? What do we what do we do with this this idea? Because I agree with you. Like yeah. Twitter's terrible. There, social media is terrible. Yep. Like it's 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 ruining people's brains. It's 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 pulling us away from what it means to be human. But what do we do with that? Yeah, it's like uh, it's like the we're talking about cigarettes, but we're only talking about the filter, or so you know what I mean. Like that's it. We're we're all walking around. We've transferred, and, and cigarettes is not a good one to one with social media, except for in the kind of conversation about pub public health, because we don't use cigarettes to conduct our politics. We don't use right. cigarettes to conduct our interpersonal relationships. And maybe people smoked in the smoke filled back rooms, but the cigarette wasn't the mechanism of communication. Um, and and so I, it, to me, it's insane. Like when Josh Hawley introduced a bill about infinite scroll, he was like laughed at, like mercilessly mocked. Um, but those are the kinds of solutions that nobody is talking about and that actually tackle the central issue here. Is this a like public... block the scroll after a while, you mean? Yeah, it, like make it, you, you cannot have infinite scroll on your website, basically, so that people can't just keep going and going. There has to be a stopping point. And now, 
we don't want to obviously copy authoritarian models like in China, which in right China in, with, with its video game problem. Yeah, they, they said kids. Okay, kids, you get what? Uh, an hour on Friday, an hour on Saturday. Yeah, like the Chinese government told all the kids. Well, TikTok like, in China is the the Chinese version. We've talked about this. The Chinese version of TikTok has mandatory pauses um, in huh. between. If you've been watching videos for too long, kids in China, if you're in a certain age range, can only use it during particular hours of the day, and then they intersperse propaganda um, in the children's version of Chinese TikTok as well. So no, good no. way to get the kids to leave TikTok. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. propaganda at them. Like, Unless all right, fine, I'll put this down. <laughs> it could be really good propaganda. It might be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not exactly Nancy Reagan propaganda yeah. but um, no so it's that no, nobody's saying that we need to bring that model here but it is but if you're not saying that then what are you saying that businesses this is the whole point right. about Elon Musk to me is like we're not even putting pressure on him to run this platform mm -hmm. responsibly in terms of public health it's we're just having a public speech conversation but like as people in the market we're all so numbed by our addictions to these yeah. products that we're not saying like we don't want this. <laughs> like right. we we need a way. We need an escape. You know, and and Apple kind of understands this and has integrated some of these things into its products, understanding that there's kind of a market desire to see tech companies do that. Right. But this entire media conversation about Elon Musk is completely completely sidestepping, I think, what's a much more important issue. And it's the issue that ends up making a, a healthier marketplace and having a healthier business economy. Right, because if you, if you don't have any, any of it regulated, then companies will only sell the most addictive exactly. product. Exactly, yeah. So if you require some regulation, then that at least gives the millions of people who do want, because they, they, they know that they need their own behavior regulated because they're addicted. Yeah. Or their kids will get addicted. So, so it's like, you know, if, if companies wouldn't, uh, wouldn't do parental controls, you would want the government to say no. Yeah. Like you have to do, you have to give parents some say. So maybe it's like that and you just expand it out. I don't know if a single journalist or anybody in public since Musk sort of stepped into this arena has asked him what he's going to do to make Twitter less addictive. Um, what he's going to do to make Twitter, you know, what I, like, and yeah. just talking in terms of like quadrupling the user base is totally the wrong direction. I think, you know, saying you want it to better humanity is great. And, and that's a much better framing than a lot of people in the in Silicon Valley come to these projects with. But I don't understand how you can do that fundamentally uh, with the way Twitter's designed. Just delete it. <laughs> delete it. I should really? delete it off my phone. We we both should. Maybe yeah. we'll do that like cleansing. I can't. I can't. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> I'm looking forward to what's on your radar next, Ryan.